We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts. It is good to be with you in this way, and I hope you have a Bible with you. We'll be looking at Acts chapter 25 tonight in just a few moments, so be turning with me to Acts chapter 25. We'll be looking at this whole chapter. Uh, we will be traveling over the next few days, so Hans is planning on preaching this coming Sunday, if the Lord wills. So if you can be here this coming Sunday at either 9 or 11, be sure to sign up online. And then also plan on being present for the Bible class at 10 as we continue looking at the exploits of King David. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts. So the book of gospel action written by uh, the beloved physician Luke to a man by the name of Theophilus, giving him a history of the early church. So that's kind of the big picture where we are. By way of very brief review, in the ABCs of Acts, we have a successive letter of the alphabet for each chapter in this book, so kind of like a memory tool. So up to this point, we've looked at the ascension, the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, a great hero, the reference to Stephen there, how can I... I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionaries sent out, not gods but men, the old law is not binding, the Philippian jailer converted, questions answered in Athens, reasoning with a preacher, saving our religious friends, Troas on the Lord's day, uproar in Jerusalem, valuable citizenship, waiting to kill Paul, and then last week we looked at the excuses of Felix. I didn't hear from anybody with a better uh, answer for X in this chapter, so I guess we're leaving it with uh, the excuses of Felix. But again, if you do have something better, let me know. Uh, by way of very brief review, just over the past few weeks, the recent past here kind of all goes together in these last few chapters. Uh, Paul has been falsely accused and nearly killed by a Jewish mob in the temple in Jerusalem. He's rescued by the Romans, taken into custody for his own protection, and as he is then imprisoned in Caesarea, he has the opportunity to teach and preach for a couple years. Uh, toward the end of Acts chapter 24, Paul discusses with Felix righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And this is where Governor Felix says, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. So the excuses of Felix. He's basically putting this off, refusing to make a decision concerning his own salvation. So at the very end of Acts 24, uh, as Felix is waiting for a bribe of some kind, Governor Festus takes over. So something happens to Felix. He gets snatched away for whatever reason. Festus takes over and uh, he leaves Paul in prison kind of as a favor for the Jews. So We've had a change in the governorship from Felix to Festus, and this is where we pick up with Acts 25. And in the ABCs of Acts, we come to the letter Y, yet untried by Caesar, yet untried by Caesar, Acts 25, and the first paragraph is Acts 25, verses 1 through 5. Festus then, having arrived in the province, three days later went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, and the chief priest and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul that he might have, them, might have him brought to Jerusalem, at the same time setting an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore he said, Let the influential men among you go up there with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. Well, starting in verse 1, we have Festus taking over as the new governor of this area. As uh, he does this, he, he heads up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Uh, Roman officials would usually land in Caesarea over there by the Mediterranean Sea, and then using Caesarea as something of a home base, they would venture out from there to visit other parts of that province. And Jer Jerusalem, of course, was high in that list of places to visit. Jerusalem was obviously one of the leading cities and considered by the Jews to be their capital. Certainly with the temple, it was the center of their religious life. Festus then heads up to Jerusalem to kind of see how things are going. He's getting to know these people. Who are you? This is who I am, and I need to, to know what you're about. Well, when Festus gets to Jerusalem, the chief priest and the leading men of the Jews bring charges against Paul. And I see this almost like little kids rushing to get somebody in trouble when the teacher comes back after having been away for a little while. So they want to get their story heard first. Only these men have the hidden agenda of looking for some way to assassinate Paul in that process. 
And these 40 men who vowed not to eat or drink until they killed Paul, they're getting pretty hungry, I'm thinking, after a period of about two years. And so they're, they're really desperate at this point. Their goal is to still have Paul brought to Jerusalem. They know they can't kill him in Caesarea. That's a fortified city. So we need you to bring him over here so we can kind of uh, figure this thing out. So they want to use that as a way to kill Paul as he's being transferred. Again, this goes back to that plot they hatched a couple years back. Well, the new governor, he's not stupid, though, and he's in this position of power for a reason. He's seen this kind of thing before. And so he reminds these men that, that Paul's being kept in custody in Caesarea. And oh, by the way, I, I'm about to leave. And so why don't you come along with me? We'll do this thing up there. So he invites the influential men to come along on that journey, giving them the invitation to prosecute Paul up there. Uh, certainly not down in Jerusalem. And that's pretty much where we left off two years ago. So not much has changed in this period, uh, other than the fact that Paul has now been confined for an additional two years. He hasn't been murdered, that's the plus side, uh, but he's still not free. So he's just kind of just hanging there, waiting to see what happens next. Uh, we have a saying, justice delayed is justice denied. I think many of us have probably heard that saying, justice delayed is justice denied. And I normally think of that in terms of the guilty not being punished until many years later. So if the punishment comes 30 years after the crime, uh, kind of what's the point in that? So justice delayed is justice denied. And that's kind of the way we think about that today. But here we also have injustice, but it's because Paul is innocent. It's not that his punishment is being delayed. It's that he's in a sense being punished for two years by being confined when he really has done nothing wrong. So justice for Paul would be freedom. But as again, the saying goes, justice delayed truly is justice denied. So Paul, an innocent man, he's still being held for no good reason other than to protect his own life. So we continue tonight with Acts 25, verses 6 through 12. Acts 25, 6 through 12. After he had spent not more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea and on the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. After Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him which they could not prove, while Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against Caesar. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then when Festus had conferred with his counsel, he answered, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. Up in verse 6, Festus stays in Jerusalem another week or so before heading back to Caesarea. And once he returns to Caesarea, he gets all situated in his official role on the tribunal. He orders Paul to be brought in at this point. And remember, as we've learned over the past few weeks, we actually still have the floor of this palace, of uh, this Roman facility where Paul most likely made his defense. And this is it, the picture on your screen there. Again, just this, this is review if you've been in class the past few weeks. But historians are, are highly confident that this is the actual place where Paul was confined and where he made his defense there. So it kind of almost looks like a, I would say maybe a fire pit or something in the middle. Of course, we don't know. We don't have the walls and the, the ceiling, the roof over this thing here. All we have is the floor. Uh, but this is it. So Paul is brought into this room, which is amazing that we still have this. And what I think I'm noticing for the first time here is that when Paul is brought in in verse 7, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. And so we have Paul surrounded by his accusers. And to me, that's a little bit shocking. I know today, normally, we have the prosecution over here on one side. We've got the defendant on the other. But here, though, Paul is surrounded, isn't he? And that just, it doesn't seem normal to me. It doesn't really seem fair. Uh, but it, it has the potential, certainly, of being quite intimidating. 
Uh, but the point for us is that the Jewish leaders, they can't prove anything. And we've been here before. They, they haven't proved this earlier. And so they can't prove it. They're bringing many charges and they're bringing serious charges. And so these are charges worthy of death in their mind, but uh, they have no proof of these things. So Paul responds by affirming, I've done nothing wrong. In other words, prove it. Yeah, a lot of big words you guys are using here, but prove it. So he hasn't committed an offense uh, either against the law of the Jews. He hasn't committed a, an offense against the temple itself. Remember, that was one of the accusations that he brought a bunch of Gentiles in there. I haven't done that. Nobody can prove it. And he certainly hasn't committed an offense against Caesar. So I haven't offended the Roman Empire. I'm just doing my own thing and haven't bothered Rome at all. So he is completely innocent and he's been confined for at least two years, but has done nothing to deserve this. Well, Festus, though, the politician that he is, is weighing this, isn't he? And I think we can maybe see it from his point of view. I've got this one man, Paul, here, versus what seems to be all of the Jewish leadership. So the question is, do I make this one man mad and put him on trial for nothing and maybe convict him or sentence him to death for no reason? Or do I let him go and then end up with every single Jewish leader mad at me? This is not the way I want to take over my new governorship here by having everybody in charge under me upset at what I'm doing. And so he tries to find a solution by asking Paul whether he might be willing to go back to Jerusalem for a trial as these men have requested. And I, I, it's almost funny to me. It almost seems like, um, it, it looks like Paul is a little bit in charge here, doesn't it? We have this governor asking Paul for his permission to go back to Jerusalem. Well, as a Roman citizen, though, Paul basically says, no way. <laughs> I am not going back there. And he knows they're trying to find a way to kill him. It was his nephew who pointed out that plot two years earlier. Um, and he knows there's no way for him to get anything remotely resembling a fair trial in Jerusalem. There's no way they will hear him. Um, and hear his side of the story and all that, which I kind of find interesting that the governor says, how about if I go there with you? So I think he was trying to anticipate some of Paul's objections here. And so that's not acceptable to Paul. I'm, I'm not going back there. This this will not end well. And remember, he has the, the prophecy from Agabus that, uh, that things will not go well in Jerusalem. And so we find that Paul appeals to his Roman citizenship again. As a Roman, I am standing right where I need to be. This is the Roman headquarters. You are a Roman governor. You're the judge. I'm a Roman. You're a Roman. We're Romans. And, and I'm right where I need to be. I've done nothing wrong, as you well know. I find it interesting he points that out here. And I think the governor does, in fact, know this. And so Paul says, if I deserve to die, let me die. I'm willing to go right here. Do it now. Um, but as it is, no, there's no way you can hand me over as an innocent man to get killed by these people. And so Paul's conclusion here is, I appeal to Caesar. And this right here changes the course of the rest of this book. This sets the tone for the next several chapters. Once those words leave Paul's mouth, a series of events is set, uh, set in place. As I understand it, this was the right of every Roman citizen. If you weren't getting justice, you could appeal your case to Caesar himself. Of course, if you were guilty, Caesar would take care of that and you would regret it. But if you were truly innocent, if you were not getting a fair trial, if, if somebody higher up was being unfair, if they were abusing you in some way, uh, Caesar was the ultimate appeal. So Caesar could overrule uh, any ruling by any lower court. So today, I guess today in our legal system, we might compare it to appealing to the president for a pardon, you know, for a federal federal crime or for a state crime, we can appeal to the uh, governor. But of course, that's once we're convicted, isn't it? So it's not a perfect parallel. Nobody's been convicted at this point, far from it. But Paul relies on his citizenship and he appeals to Caesar to have this case heard by the emperor himself. Notice in verse 12, uh, Festus talks it over with his counsel, so he consults. That's a very wise thing to do. He doesn't just issue a ruling on his own. He's new to this, so probably he's been promoted in some way. So he's new to this situation, so he brings his people together. What do I do here? And his answer is, well, you have appealed to Caesar, so to Caesar you shall go. And at this point, there's really not much Festus can do about it. He could maybe try to block this. But if Caesar eventually finds out that uh, that he's done this, Festus is pretty much on his own here. And uh, he's on the line for anything that happens. So Festus then kind of 
backs away from this case very slowly, very carefully. Uh, this is about to not be his problem anymore, but we still do have a problem. So let's continue tonight with Acts 25, 13 through 22. Acts 25, 13 through 22. Now, when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. While they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix, and when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appeared, appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So we continue then with Acts 25, verses 13 through 22. And in this paragraph, we don't have too much new information in this passage, other than the fact that Festus's boss, King Agrippa, comes for a visit. So as we look at this paragraph, it's King Agrippa, the higher up, kind of the between uh, the emperor and Festus, he comes in for a visit. So King Agrippa comes in maybe to welcome Festus to this new position uh, that he's just been given. And while he's there, Festus pretty much says, you know, thanks for the welcome, but you know there's this interesting case that was just totally dumped on me on my first day in office, and I've been dealing with this. And so he explains it. He runs through the details of the case. And I love at the end of verse 14 how Festus emphasizes that this is not his problem. You know, Felix left me this guy. So, we, again, we don't know the details from the book of Acts here as to why Felix is no longer with us. But I think Festus takes this as an opportunity. Um, the guy who was in this chair before me, he had this thing going on here, and now it's my problem. So, the Jews want this guy dead. And we try not to do that without some kind of a trial, as you know, King Agrippa. So I got his accusers together. They had a whole bunch of nothing. Their charges were not what I was expecting. This is like a religious dispute. They're arguing over a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul claims to be alive. And, um, you know, we've noted many times in this book that the resurrection changes everything. And I just find it interesting that everybody knows that Paul is claiming that Jesus is alive. And, and that's interesting to me. So this is no secret. This is the basis of his preaching. Anytime Paul had an opportunity, he would preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, this is fascinating to, uh, to Festus here. So Festus and Agrippa, they discuss Paul's appeal to Caesar. And King Agrippa expresses some interest in hearing from Paul himself. So let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph. This is Acts 25, 23 through 27. Acts 25, 23 through 27. So on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my lord, therefore I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. 
Well, in this passage, we have a huge royal ceremony. I think pomp is mentioned up there in verse 23. So a state dinner, as we might describe this today. So all of the dignitaries are there, all of the important people, good food. Uh, this is the place to be. So Festus then has Paul brought in in front of this crowd in this room that we now have a picture of today. And Festus outlines the problem. I've got this guy. The Jews want him dead. He seems to be innocent. He's appealed to Caesar. But I don't know how to fill out the paperwork on this one. I think that's a pretty good summary, in my opinion, of what's going on here. If I send this guy to Caesar, I've got to explain it. I need some charges. So I can't send him to the Jews. I can't let him go. And I can't send him to Caesar unless I tell Caesar what the problem is. And I don't really know what the problem is. Because if I send him to Caesar without charges... That makes me look bad. He's going to send them back to me and tell me to deal with it, and I can't deal with it. And I think this sets us up for next week, where Paul will then be invited to explain his case, uh, both to Festus and to King Agrippa. So for now, he is yet untried by Caesar, isn't he? So we've got the why there for this chapter. So chapter 25, why? Yet untried by Caesar. We haven't really gotten anywhere tonight, have we? We haven't really learned some new thing about the case. Um, Paul hasn't been murdered. That's a positive. He goes one more chapter without being murdered, but he's not free either, and it, it can't continue forever like this. So let's plan on picking up next week, if the Lord wills, with Acts chapter 26. I hope you can read ahead. It's a neat chapter, and we have some songs based on this next chapter, so feel free to look those up and be ready for that. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be together tonight. I know it's uh, right before the holidays here. Most of us have a lot going on. So uh, I hope you could be present for worship this coming Sunday. Nothing more important we can do than that, to come together with God's people, either at 9 or 11. And again, plan on joining us for class in between at uh, 10 o'clock. And let me know if there's anything we need to uh, be praying about. The bulletins have already been printed, so it's too late for that. Those I left at uh, the church building when I on my way out the door this past Lord's Day. So those are there. They're ready for you on Sunday. But if there are any changes, let me know, and I'll try to get that out to the congregation. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the King of kings, and the Lord of all lords. You alone have all power and all authority, and tonight we've seen your power delegated to rulers here on this earth in a way that saves Paul's life and gives him some unique opportunities to preach the good news. Tonight we're thankful for our earthly government. They aren't perfect, but we're thankful for the freedom that we have. We're thankful for opportunities to preach and teach your word. We pray that you would bless those who serve in government in all capacities, bless them with wisdom that they would use their power appropriately. Tonight, we ask your blessing on those who are traveling. Be with us as we interact with our families. Bless us with patience that we may treat each other with love, doing for others as we would like to have done for ourselves. Thank you for sending Jesus to this earth. What an amazing blessing. Thank you for that indescribable gift. We come to you tonight in his name. In Jesus we pray. Amen.